Um, but all I'm going to do now is uh, hand over to Professor Zirilli. So if we could all give him a warm welcome, that would be great. Thank you, Paul. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me, and it's nice to be here with you. Uh, I may not have time to address the questions that are of most interest to you, <laughs> but I'm going to touch on, on it at any rate. Um, uh, I am going to draw a little bit from uh, when the body becomes all eyes, just just as a starting point. Um, and by the way, uh, I, I don't need to be called professor. I'm kind of, I, I'm not teaching now. I, 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 I'm a director, performer. I run my own small theater company. Uh, and uh, I've left full-time teaching in, in the academy about five or six years ago. Uh, to pursue my artistic work exclusively. And uh, what I do, basically, I use martial arts, and I've used them for many, many years in training performers. And that's where my focus is. Uh, I certainly got, I was fortunate. I'll just mention that I was very fortunate with my Kalari Payat training. I've also trained in Tai Chi and had experience in other martial arts as well. But um, I've really focused my uh, work with the martial arts on transferring and translating its principles and uh, elements toward the work of performers, actors and dancers. And so I will be giving a few examples of that later. Uh, so just a brief uh, methodological overview that does draw a bit from, from uh, when the body becomes all eyes. Uh, one way of examining martial arts is uh, as one of many forms of embodied cultural practice through which body minds, modes of knowledge and types of knowledge, powers, agency, as well as selves and identities are repositioned and reformed. That is, through the techniques and discourses that constitute such practices and the environments in which they are taught, um, certain repositionings and reformations develop. Given the inherent complexity of any kind of embodied knowledge, practice or knowledge, my own research on embodied practices has been decidedly interdisciplinary and necessarily utilizes historiography, sociological, anthropological, ethnographic techniques, as well as uh, an emphasis, especially in my most recent work on phenomenology and a specific branch of cognitive science known as dynamic systems theory. I'll be touching on this. Uh, um, even in a, the length of a keynote, I don't have time to go into near as much detail as one would always want to. Um, now, as, all of, as many of you will know, uh, as discussed by Maus de Citeau and Bourdieu, everyday practices, everyday practices, such as walking, driving, hygienic practices, often become habitualized and routinized. And uh, I've always differentiated these kinds of embodied practices, the kind of everyday that become habitualized and routinized from the more specialized more virtuosic forms of pra embodied practices, like the martial arts, performing uh, somatic practices, whether that's someone who is working with Pilates or, uh, or massage therapies, or a surgeon. Um, and often long-term training has to be undertaken in order to become accomplished, of course, in any of these kinds of embodied practices to reach a certain level of expertise. This is a given. Um, so extraordinary time, energy, and resources are often invested by both the society and culture, occasionally, and sometimes not, as well as by individuals in these forms of specialized training, uh, by means of which it's possible for personal, social, ritual, and or 
in some cultures, cosmological realities to be created and enacted. This is always, of course, context-specific. Because embodied practices are not things, but an active embodied doing, they are intersections where personal, social, and cosmological experiences and realities can be negotiated, and often are. Again, it depends on the context as to which of these and how much of these multiple realities are addressed in, in any specific context. And to examine any specific type of embodied practice is to examine multiple sets of relationships and experiences. A practice, therefore, and any embodied practice, is not a history, but practices always exist within and create histories, plural. Because there may be two practitioners who are doing things differently. They're creating do two different histories. Likewise, a practice is not a discourse, but implicit in any practice, its structure and the specific techniques through which a particular body-mind is shaped are multiple discourses and at least one, if not several, paradigms through which the experience of practice and the techniques can be reflected upon as one practices. Now, following the work of uh, Paul Connerton, martial arts, somatic practices, meditation, and performance may all be considered as forms of what he calls incorporating practices, through which the body-mind forms of consciousness and therefore experience and meaning are culturally shaped in its actual practices and behaviors. And through long-term practice and repetition and guidance, a specific set of psychophysiological techniques as well as discourses and the socio-cultural context within which that practice takes place collectively constitute the possibility for some type of reformation or some might call it a transformation of a self, of one's agency in relation to those techniques or in relation to other types of agency, uh, to certain forms of culturally specific power as it's understood within that socio-cultural context, and or to certain types of behavior. So a variety of reformations are possible. But this always depends on the particular embodied practice and on what a particular teacher emphasizes. Sometimes there's far too much generalization about a certain kind of practice. And one of the things I've tried to do in my own research is to focus specifically on how much individual variation there is amongst teachers, where the same techniques are used for very, very different purposes, with very, very different uh, results in the formation or reformation of persons, their behavior, and so on. As cultural theor theorist Richard Johnson asserts, and I quote, subjectivities are produced. This is now a commonplace. I think this is true. Subjectivities are produced, not given, and are therefore the objects of inquiry, not the premises or starting points. So this is a very, I take a very processual view of the ongoing temporal constitution of both selves and of practices and therefore of the types of experience and meanings that are made available in and through those practices. So there are many kinds of bodies, many kinds of minds, many kinds of relationships uh, between bodies and minds depending on the practice or modes of consciousness that are fashioned in some way, to, follow, to borrow Doreen Kondo's term, so all of these are always in a process of being crafted. And um, uh, I, I would assume that for all of you who practice specific types of martial arts and or other forms of embodied practice, that, that, that notion of it being processual and constantly in 
a certain sense, in reformation. Uh, even after 40 years of practice, I find myself discovering certain things that I don't know or that appear to me in a new and different way, which is part of what keeps us alive, perhaps, in doing these kinds of things, because there's something else to discover. Uh, and that's a part of the richness of many of the Asian martial arts, as well as somatic practices, uh, performance traditions. If, if one never stops learning or is open to what might be learned, because there might be something else to discover in that practice, it's a gift. Now, in uh, When the Body Becomes All Eyes, I identified and examined a complex nexus of four interactive arenas within which Kalari Payet, uh, and within which I examined Kalari Payet in that particular book. Um, the first was the literal arena of practice, that is, the place where Kalari Payet is taught, or the places, I should say. The social arena, that is, the governing bodies and the networks of of practitioners that, um, that help shape practice uh, and the annual events around which, in India at least, in Kerala, Kalari Payat practitioners gather together to uh, have competitions and so on. There's also the arena of cultural production that generates live and mediatized presentations and representations of the practice, which is of most interest to Paul. And this area I did discuss but uh, perhaps because it, I'm not a specialist in media, I didn't go that far with it. Um, but I acknowledge in When the Body Becomes All Eyes this area, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, just a little bit. Uh, and then finally is the arena of experience and self-formation. Now it's this final one that happens to interest me most because I work in the arts, because I work in theater. And the, this is the arena where creative work takes place. And so uh, while sociologically and ethnographically I've always been interested in these other areas, my focus tends to be on embodied practices as phenomenon, as a phenomenon and as a process. Uh, so I'm in, 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 as I move along in this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on this last area that I identified and explored partly in, in the Kerala and other contexts uh, in When the Body Becomes All Lies. I'll be focusing primarily on this arena of experience um, uh, in practice, in embodied practice. Uh, <clears throat> now, all embodied practices assume both some kind of body and usually assume some form of virtuosic, optimal, or idealized state of inner actualization. This may or may not be articulated, but I think it's usually assumed in some way, even if it's not articulated. Uh, so embodied practice, practices may be considered dynamic events. And I'm going to talk about this as a, a bit later as I get into the substance of the talk. But before turning to this, this area of, of, of embodied practices as dynamic events, and places where forms of inner actualization take place, I want to briefly comment on the arena of cultural production within Kalari Payat in the past and within which it's practiced today. Um, now, uh, one of my earliest publications that I doubt anyone here has read uh, <laughs> Is, uh, is a two-part article that was published in a journal called Sangeet Natak in India called From Martial Arts to Performance. And it's a, it's a, it's a very early study where I, I am talking about the huge range of traditional performance genres in Kerala that have been influenced in one way or another and that are forms of cultural performance and representation of a martial heroic display ethos within Kerala society and culture. It's not something that's, uh, that's in when the body becomes all lies because I couldn't do everything in the book. Uh, but uh, this was a very early publication and I, I just have a, a couple of slides up here. Um, uh, that uh, I want to share with you. And this early essay was trying to, to outline uh, something of the fact that combat <coughs> systems, martial arts, 
uh, and combat techniques have had, of course, a profound and lasting impact on the development of cultural, what I would call cultural performances in specific cultural contexts. Uh, so whether that's in decentralized tribal cultures of a certain period or whether that's in politically centralized states, uh, specific techniques of hunt or of battle or of martial arts practice have been transformed constantly into performances that symbolically, representationally, and or in some way try to encapsulate something about uh, something that has to do with a kind of heroic display ethos uh, that marks in some way a particular cultural form of dynamic uh, energy uh, that often is aroused in, in a martial arts practice. Um, now, Kerala has a huge number of these. Uh, th this is one that's called Ochirikali that takes place. It's like a mass uh, enactment of an historical <coughs> combat where they have stick dancers and huge crowds. I mean, it's like thousands of people gather every year uh, for the Ochirikali. Uh, uh, it's a ritual quasi-combat performance. None of these people are trained in Kalari Payat, but there's a... There, there's a a collective recollection of this in this of the heroic in Kerala where that in India like in other Asian cultures that's always been very important um, even if uh, most of the martial arts in India weren't known for years and years and years in the repertoire of, of world martial arts um, uh, and another uh, so that's one of many and the, on the left, your left-hand side, this is a, an image of Chathanunadagam, which is a Christian dance drama form, where they, they, they did have some minimal Kalari training. Christians, Muslims, and Hindus all practice Kalari Payat traditionally, more Hindus than others, but, but uh, amongst the, uh, the uh, Latin Christian communities, this became a very important uh, performance genre. And they always had, in the middle of it, key battle scenes that kind of are quasi-like, a little bit like some Kalari Payat technique. But the point is it's not trying to put the martial art on stage. It's, it's encapsulating something about that in this cultural form. And on the right here, we have two others. Uh, Kol Kali, which is a Muslim stick dance. And again, these are not people trained in, in the martial arts. And this is Vela Kali. And these are all, you know, uh, Vela Kali is a huge festival at, at a particular temple in uh, uh, one part of Kerala. Uh, so just one other slide here, and that is, um, this is from Kathakali dance drama. And uh, Kathakali dance drama was heavily influenced by Kalari Payat in terms of its preliminary training. So this is a a great king who at, at a particular moment when he's revealing what's called Raudra, which is fur a furious internal state. And I've written about this at length, and it's a, it's a fascinating uh, encapsulation and, and cultural interpretation of uh, the st the, 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 a state of awareness and consciousness of somebody who's going to kill someone. And sometimes we don't necessarily think about the reality of martial arts which are intended to kill. And in Kerala, this is very, very clear because in Kathakali dance dramas, the titles of plays are things like Kichikavadam. It's the killing of Kichika. In English, they used to translate this in the late 19th and early 20th century as the death of, which is like very, you know, it's like Somebody dies, okay. No, it's the act of killing, which has a lot to do with, resonates with uh, all kinds of markers in Indian culture and South Indian culture in particular. And so uh, this is a, a very key kind of point about how these uh, traditional performance genres, you know, um, tell us a lot about the martial tradition itself and how they are embedded in a specific cultural context. So um, a part of what I, uh, I wanted, want to do is um, uh, move on to more recent kinds of, so there's this very long history uh, of 
uh, performative manifestations of either the martial art itself, uh, where it becomes, so to speak, spectacularized uh, through public displays. Uh, and this is normal, I think. You know, again, militaries are always displaying themselves in our cultures. You know, there's, you, know you have the big, uh, you know, in China or in Russia and tanks rolling down the street. And this muscular form of spectacularization of the ability to kill is a part of what is behind uh, this. That part of it doesn't interest me personally because I'm a pacifist. <laughs> and so, uh, but, uh, um, but uh, I find it interesting to look at these issues. So this was in 1983 in Palgat, Kerala, uh, when um, I, I have no idea of whether they used to do anything like this before Bruce Lee movies. But uh, uh, doing uh, these, uh, you know, something like this, jumping over three of your, of your colliery uh, mates and uh, breaking three clay tiles, or t roof tiles, um, this becomes one of the uh, popular modes of spectacularization when you're doing a demonstration of martial arts techniques. Um, and it's difficult to know whether that, how, how old that is. But um, what, I, what I want to do is just visit briefly with, um, about this notion of spectacularization. Um, uh, Bill Beeman, who's an anthropologist, uh, uh, argues that, and I quote, spectacle is usually a public display of a society's central meaningful elements. And I think this is, that's what these spectacles do. Um, and uh, as John McAloon observes, spectacles must be of a certain size and grandeur and given, give primacy to visual, sensory, and symbolic codes. They are things to be seen. Uh, hence, we refer to circuses as spectacles, but not orchestral performances. We usually don't think of them as spectacles. Um, uh, Within the Kerala context, especially during Onam Festival, what I have defined as this heroic display ethos is on display in colored repayat demonstrations uh, such as this. And there's also a spectacularization of colored repayat generated by attempts uh, to bring visibility to colored repayat within the world of martial arts today. And a lot of claims about it being the oldest and mother of all martial art which I think is historically completely inaccurate. But again, these kinds of claims are normal uh, within, uh, within uh, uh, practices that, that are overlooked, but it's historically uh, a bit silly, really. Uh, um, but find anything on YouTube. Now, I'm going to talk about YouTube for a minute. And it was interesting that Paul mentioned that one of his students had, had said, uh, your student was reading when the body becomes all eyes and had looked online on YouTube at clips of Kalari Payet and it didn't seem anything like what I was describing. Is that right? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, let's, uh, let's go over. Uh, which is absolutely the case. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about that for a moment uh, before going on. Now, this is, uh, this is a video of... Um, uh, yeah, why don't we just? Oh no, why don't maybe if we just do this for a minute and then do that again? Yeah, and then play. And then just yeah, play yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. This is taking place during an Onam festival celebration in New Delhi, where people from Kerala, many Malayalis live in Delhi, and so it's for the Malayali community. It's like uh, there, and uh, so they're comp you know they're on a grassy area and. The, uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to show a little bit of this. Now, this is a this is a particular pattern or technique that is done slowly, 
Uh, it is a uh, worshiping of the, the uh, deities of the Kaladi with the body. And um, Kaladi Payat is does help people in certain of its styles to become very, very flexible. And this particular form is done fairly slowly. But then in the video, they slow it down even further and use slow motion for effect. And uh, um, Now, it's not so much that that I am, ah, yeah, it's, it's the work with weapons that I'm going to call your attention to. Now, if you watch the eyes of the practitioners, they're doing a choreography. We can turn it off. We can stop. We can stop it. I, they're doing, a, they're doing this almost as a choreography, so that the, the, uh, uh, so the, the earlier uh, exercise, actually, uh, this group, uh, especially the, the woman, she's very good. She has very good form and very good kind of internal, I would say she has a very clear internal connection to what she's doing. But as soon as you get into the weapons work, uh, it tends to become in this case, a kind of choreography that's quite surface, where the, the l potential for lethal force is just not present. Now, I'm interested in lethal force, even though I'm a pacifist, in relation to the exchange of energy when I'm practicing, as long as nobody gets hurt. <laughs> and so that's always part of it. Because actually, and so most of the things you see on YouTube have been, in a certain sense, choreographed for a mass audience and spectacularized, and you don't see the kind of inner work that's going on in weapons practice as well. And, and so um, I just wanted to mark that because I think it's, uh, it's um, yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon. And because, I would say, um, this tends to, um, it can lead to, uh, lead people in certain direction. Um, for example, uh, individuals become extraordinarily flexible with color repayment. There's a straight leg kick where, you know, what, once upon a time, when I was a certain age and didn't have bad arthritis, uh, you kick your leg up and it comes all the way up to the shoulder. And it's done very, very quickly and it's very light when it's done properly. And it's, it's, it's really quite striking. Uh, but again, what's the inner relationship to the energetic lines that are a part of the inner actualization of one's relationship to the physical body? So there's a saying sometimes uh, in Kerala, the body in Kalari Payat practice, the body should become like a rubber band, you know, that flexible. And you see that uh, among young practitioners. And that's wonderful, but sometimes that becomes the goal. That is how flexible. And here, yoga is the same way. Because in certain kinds of yoga practice, it becomes like gymnastics. And it becomes a choreography rather than something that, that is mediating between the inner and the outer. Now, when I use inner and outer, I'm not trying to be a dualist. But these things mark our experience, and I think we need to talk about them. So even though I often engage in discussions of the inner dimensions and the outer dimensions, recognizing that in good practice, this, you know, this, it, it, you know, we're working at erasing that kind of inner outer but the thing is, there are outer dimensions to a practice, and there are inner dimensions to the practice. And, uh, and so I'm going to focus now in the, in the body of my talk on these inner dimensions of practice. And we can always have a conversation further, Paul, uh, about you know, some of these, um, uh, these other 
uh, cultural formations of, uh, of color repipe. Um, so I'm going to shift gears here away from the spectacularization to that side of these practices that is of more interest to, to me at this point, um, which has to do with uh, um, sensory attunement, uh, att using practices, embodied practices, to um, gain, um, to come into a place of very, very subtle sensory attunement and awareness. Uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, wrote the following, sensing is this living communication with the world that makes it present to us as a familiar place of our life. The perceived object and the perceived perceiving subject owe their thickness to this sensing. And Tim Ingold wrote recently, to be sentient is to be open to the world. And I think uh, this quotation uh, is one I'll, I'll tease out a bit. To yield to its embrace and to resonate in one's inner being to its illuminations and reverberations. The Latin sentire means to feel. To be sentient is to be open to feeling. To be sensing and thereby experiencing a world. Now, I don't necessarily mean emotion when I'm talking about feeling. Uh, when we move into certain forms of theater, we start touching on things like uh, uh, emotion. Specific sensory and experiential worlds are potentially opened by long-term, in-depth practice of meditation, martial arts, somatic practices such as massage and acting and performance. And within many approaches to embodied practice, there exists the potential to gradually elaborate or unfold a certain complexity or thickness of sensing, a thickness of sensing that constitutes the living world or the potential living world of that practice. There is available, if one attends to it and opens one's awareness to it, the experience an emergent experience. I'm not going to try and define that, by the way, and uh, I'll, I may talk about that if I have time, I may not. But So the question I ask is, how does one learn to be sentient? And I ask that as a teacher of both martial arts and of acting. How does one learn to be sentient, to uh, learn to be attentive, to bring into, what is it we're bringing into the foreground at any particular point? What's remaining in the background? How do we negotiate this territory between foreground and background in what we are doing? It's something we do, of course, in martial arts. It's something we do in acting. There are different qualitative dimensions, so I'm not trying to reduce these things to each other. And I'll be clear about that in a moment, I hope. Um, uh, <clears throat> what are the illuminations and reverberations afforded by particular processes of embodied practice? within a specific context. Now, um, the notion of affordances comes from James Gibson's work, who's a psychologist, and I think his work is very important in this regard, and it's a, something that's picked up by, by what's called dynamic systems theory or enactment theory within the general framework of cognitive science. It's one branch of cognitive science today that some of you may be aware of. Uh, and this branch I find particularly useful uh, in thinking through certain issues. Because the notion of affordances is about what is afforded by a particular, in a particular context. Now, that is what's possible to do within that context. Uh, what is pos what's possible to learn in that context. So uh, this becomes a framing device for me in relation to teaching. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to step sideways for a minute, not literally, over here somewhere, but I'm going to uh, play a, uh, an audio recording of a performance uh, by Patricia Boyette of the very last section of Samuel Beckett's play, Rockabye. I know many of you are not from performance, 
Uh, so I thought I would have something for you to engage with that is performative. And this, uh, Patricia is a professional actress. We're the same age. She and I have worked together extensively on Samuel Beckett's shorter, later plays. And uh, I'm going to just give you a brief context about, about this, this particular play. Uh, this is a 30-minute play called Rockabye. It possesses, possesses what I would describe as a unique form of iterate, iterative ambiguity or shattered language, like many of other Beckett's later plays. And Patricia Boyette is, is she's a woman sitting in a rocking chair, being rocked. She is not rocking herself. I want to make that clear. She's sitting in a chair. So if this is a rocking chair, and I were Patricia, you would see that my feet are off the floor. And over the 30 minutes, she's seated, as you see her, in black costume, and she is being rocked in time with the text. Nothing else happens. Three times, the audio tape you're going to hear, which is her own voice, stops, and she says a single word. More. Then the rocking continues. So you can see that she is not rocking herself. I'm playing this for you because this has to do with sensitization. And I'm going to ask you, I might invite you, because it's just this image, uh, to even close your eyes and open your auditory awareness to the sound of her voice. Okay? So I'm going to invite you into a certain kind of spectatorship. Now if she was here, you would have your eyes open and could watch her. But I don't think I'm a good stand-in for Patricia. So, um, uh, one just other little note. So she's listening to her own voice, which is pre-recorded, and um, yes, there's a, a lighting from the side here so that there's, it looks like there's a window next to her. So I'll just play this for you. Come on. Media not found. Oh. Uh-oh. We tried it before and it worked. Before. Uh, oh. So, we had it here. Oh. Oh, it's fine. Sorry. We tried it out so oh, well. Before. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to, I will stand in for Patricia because I have no choice. The text goes something like this. So in the end, close of a long day, she said to herself, whom else? And it goes on. Uh, uh, I think I'm going to do a different Beckett text that I perform because quite do it. Um, there's another text called uh, Ohio Impromptu that begins as follows. Um, and I'm just seated at a table with someone who looks exactly like me. It's like a still life image. And you can't see my face because my hand is over my face. And this piece lasts about 20 minutes. And it begins, <clears throat> I'm reading a book to this other fellow who's sitting here looks like my twin, okay? Who is this? It's never explained. So, this is the way the text goes. Little is left to tell. In a last attempt to obtain relief, he moved from where they had been so long together to a single room on the far bank. Relief, he had hoped, would flow from unfamiliarity. Unfamiliar room. And so on. 
Now, you will notice that I'm using a reduced vocal inflection, and I'm not using my everyday voice. Beckett's laser text, he asked that these be performed without color. These are very difficult things to be able to do performatively and to do effectively. Now, um, the reason I was going to play you a bit of Rockabye is because it's, a, she, uh, it's about her death. Ohio Impromptu is also about death. <laughs> Many of Beckett's plays revolve around issues of death. And I think that, um, I think it's useful at a martial arts conference to, to bring up the issue of death because it's central to theater as well. Uh, the thing is that in theater we're often working with performing things that, that get people to reflect upon issues about our mortality and the, our place in the world. Uh, so, um, and a part of the, what I do in my work is to try to have a way of helping uh, actors to work with uh, the notion of an inner animation that comes out of work with martial arts, with what in Kalari Payat and India is known as, uh, as a prana or a pranavayu and ki or chi in the East Asian martial arts. But there's always some notion of animation, and this is something we find in, in cultures throughout the world, of course. And it's the notion of life force, of what is it that is the essence that all of a sudden it's gone and we are no more. Uh, and this is one of the great things about working in theater. Uh, you know, you, you are, you're dealing with these issues, if you wish to, a lot. Uh, and I find it very refreshing to do so. Um, this is a, a quotation from... Uh, a, uh, a note written by a future cadaver donor to a medical student that Rachel Prentice quotes in her very interesting book called Bodies in Formation. It's an ethnography of anatomy and surgical education that was recently published. Um, I think it's an interesting study because again, I'm reflecting with you on formation and she's reflecting on how surgeons are formed. Uh, and again, I, I, I just had surgery a couple of months ago. For, I had an incisional hernia from having had cancer of the bladder year, 10 years ago. And so I've had all kinds of surgery. And I sure as hell hope that the surgeons that, that operate on me are virtuosic in their embodied practice. And, and she writes about how they're being trained. And that's quite fascinating, I think, to think about how surgeons are trained because they're using scalpels. They're using instruments that could kill us and that do sometimes, unfortunately. And so um, uh, this is the great uh, Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson, of course. This is all staged, by the way, speaking of representations. This is a com complete staging. This isn't actually what would have happened. Uh, it's Rembrandt's rendering of an idea of, uh, of an anatomy lesson in 1632. Um, now, of course, from Middle English, Middle French, from the Latin corpus, a dead body, especially of a human being, something that is no longer active or vital. Um, so I'm interested in going back to this underlying sense of uh, what's vital to vitality to uh, the initiation. Uh, the work of Maxine Sheets Johnstone, I think, is quite interesting. I don't know if you all will know her work. She's a dance phenomenologist. And she has a body of work that I think is quite important. Um, and in her work, uh, she emphasizes one of the things that often is left out of a lot of, of, a lot of work, which is the centrality of movement of kinesthetic movement and proprioceptive awareness in, uh, in our, our initiation as human beings. And she's drawn a lot on some of the work of uh, those who study infants 
Uh, Stern, uh, what is Stern's first name? Uh, Daniel. Daniel, thank you. Yeah, Daniel Stern, thank you. Who shouted that out? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, it must be Daniel. Uh, Daniel Stern's work. So um, uh, I think that, that um, her scholarship is quite interesting. Sometimes I think she goes a bit too far with some of the critiques of enactment theory, but I think that her work is very interesting because uh, she calls our attention again to uh, proprioception and kinesthetic movement and self-movement as something we tend to forget. I just happened to be in the US uh, and saw a grandchild. And you know, watching an infant again after I hadn't for quite a long time, and Ben has an infant, and so maybe that's why you're up on this, Ben. Uh, so it's like they're constantly in movement. And this is what she Johnstone calls our attention to. And as we're socialized and, and enculturated, that's, that kind of movement is often enculturated and socialized out of us in some way. And then we, we have to go through special trainings to start to get back in touch with movement. I'm not just talking here about overt physical movement, but about how there's a generation of an animating force in an infant. And what is it? As soon as the infant's born, there's breath, there is sound, there is movement. And there's a presence in the world that wasn't there before. Fantastic. Yeah, it's life. Uh, the other side of, of what are, and so martial arts, are, I think, are all tied up, as, a, as is theater, with, with both sides. With death, with our mortality, with our potential mortality, and with the animating force of birth and life. And of course, in, in the Asian martial arts, we have very rich traditions for identifying some of these, uh, some very specific pathways and dimensions of these inner animating forces that help us come to know the world in a certain way that sensitize us in certain ways. Um, <clears throat> How long do I go until? I've got another, I've got a little while yet. Okay. okay. I want to give a few examples of the kinds of things I'm, uh, you know, that about notions of sensitization. Um, um, it's something I've been writing about quite a bit. And um, I'm just going to give a few examples, practical examples, and talk about them and uh, why I think uh, they're, they're important. I, I think what I'll do is, is uh, start from um, – I'm going to start with touch. Uh, In a recent book called Touch, The Science of Hand, Heart, and Mind by um, neuroscientist David Linden at Johns Hopkins University, he says the following, touch is not optional for human development. He's talking about infants. You know, if there's not touch, it can be a disaster if, if children, if infants are not touched, if the tactile it is not part of, of uh, the care and attention that infants receive. He says, in, in everyday speech, at least in English, the tactile is so entangled with the emotional that when we encounter someone who's emotionally clumsy, we often call that person tactless. That is, that person lacks touch. Uh, Linden reports, and uh, those of you from other cultural areas could comment on this, of course. He says that we find similar assumptions in Indo-European language groups, that is, that emotions uh, are called feelings, not sightings or smellings. Um, and uh, I want to, to, he goes into the science of touch and its intricacies uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the neurophysiology of touch. 
Uh, and I think this is quite important because you know it, it helps it helps us to understand some of the ways in which subtle sensitivity arises. In Kalari Payat practice, in the style that, the main style that I practice, which is from uh, Govindi Kujinaya, we see here in the um, Kalari Payat is usually done barefoot on, on a carpeted surface, so I'm gonna keep these up. So the lion is a pose that's like this. And when you move forward into another lion, you're sliding the foot on the floor. And you know, uh, all martial arts are working through repetition if, if they're, they're form trainings. And so what is it that, what work is that form doing? And how does a teacher, through the discursive construct of their pedagogy, do they call attention to certain aspects or dimensions of the subtlety of the practice? Or, as in my own training in India, you're just left to your own devices and if you're fortunate, you discover something and you become virtuosic. That's the traditional way of teaching. Nothing is ever explained. Although sometimes a teacher would touch the student. And this was very important when it happened. But there wasn't an explanation. When I'm teaching, I actually give a lot of information to students. Because I was able to go to Carroll and live there for seven years. And when I'm working professionally with actors, if I'm going to use something from a martial art, I have to make it accessible and useful for the actor. And uh, I feel a professional responsibility as a theater director to make sure that what I do is accessible for performers and that they don't have to go to Carroll for seven years if I'm going to use some of these techniques. So, so I articulate certain things. Now, you know, some people might, oh, giving away secrets. These are not secrets. <laughs> and also, the, the other thing I would point out is that um, uh, this does not, if I articulate something, the individual has to have a certain kind of experience and actualization that that triggers. I'm not saying it is this, but what I, when I'm teaching, I will give instructions like this after people have at least done a couple of days of practice. Sense the sole of your right foot. <clears throat> Focus is directly ahead. You're looking from Dantian or from Nabi Mula and Malayalam through the sole of the foot. As I slide the right foot forward, I sense the sole of the left foot. So you're driving the energy down through the sole of the foot, through both feet. Now, if you observe a really good practitioner Kalari Payat, that's what you will see. So somebody could say, oh, I'm giving away secrets. No, the student still has to do the work and still has to discover what that is in her body or in his body. Uh, so I teach very much as a Westerner, as somebody who's been brought up in the West, and I don't pretend I'm a Malayali. Uh, and I don't, even though I have guru kal status, I do not act like a traditional Indian guru because sometimes they're quite brutal. And I, I'm just not, you know, and it's very hierarchical and I don't work that way. Uh, so, uh, so I'm full of contradictions when it comes to... to so, so I'm calling attention here to a certain kind of opening of awareness. Now, in later training, Kalari Payat, a very important part of advanced Kalari Payat training is massage. And you find this massage in Kathakali dance drama training. And this massage, um, do you want to be a subject? <laughs> Paul, do you mind? I'm do. Just lie, lie down on the floor, here. <laughs> <laughs> this way or this way? Uh, why don't you lie on your stomach? Okay, just lie on your stomach. Oh, thank you, Paul. It's participatory, okay. I'm holding on to ropes suspended from the ceiling, okay? He has no clothes on and we put copious amounts of oil on his body. <laughs> you okay? So I'm holding on to ropes and actually I, I, um, I begin by, by actually um, slapping the, the lower back region, opposite Muladhara chakra. 
And then I'm holding onto the rose, I start massaging with the foot, okay? And the massage is a whole body massage, thank you, Paul. But obviously I can put an awful lot of pressure. And so training in the massage is, was traditionally the last thing someone would learn because it, you have to sensitize the feet to what you're doing because you're giving it with the feet and with the hands partly. And so that action of working with the feet because in a certain sense you're working energetically or with prana, pranavayu through the feet and you're having to read the individual's body. It's, it's a very subtle form of sensitization that has to go on in a tactile way through the feet and the palms. That in turn, going through that kind of training in a somatic, what I would call a somatic practice, it's an integral part of color repayat, uh, it, and because it's kind of the physical therapy side of, of color repayat training in, in Kerala. Um, uh, the, um, uh, that is absolutely crucial to weapons work because you're sensitizing the palms. In, in Kalari Payat practice, weapons are held very loosely in the hand. They're not gripped hard because that blocks the prana. And so a sword is swung very loosely. Like so, okay? And so the hand is moving and the sword is moving in the hand and it's the energetic connection that extends. And again, that's, that's a commonplace in, in martial arts, that the extension of energy through the end of the weapon. Uh, but how does one learn that? How, is one sensitized, how does one sensitize the palm to a place where that becomes palpable and where it's visible to the observer? So um, these are, this is just some of the territory that that I continue to explore, uh, you know, mainly now working with actors, uh, but continuing to train people with color tai chi and, and yoga. So um, uh, I'll just, met, I'm, I'm working on a book on kind of phenomenology of acting, but uh, I'm writing a lot about, again, uh, issues that are completely relevant to martial arts as well, which has to do with, um, specific uh, with how, again, how we direct our attention, but how we also simultaneously have an open awareness when we're directing our attention. So I hope this opens up a number of questions uh, for the conference. Uh, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I try to, you know, uh, uh, muck about in, uh, in these, uh, in this territory with embodied practice. So thank you very much, and we'll have questions, I think. Okay, thanks very much. So, um, we've got about 20, 15, 20 minutes for questions and discussion. Would anyone, yeah? Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, just a comment and a question, uh, hopefully not getting too long for uh, I think it's a very deep and wide topic. Uh, the, the, the observation the comment is, I'm going to talk about the uh, traditional and Western pedagogy. Yeah. And so I've just spoke last year in this conference quite the same topic in Kung Fu. So um, it's kind of um, helped build my, my work on the water. The question, um, you talked about inner and outer and how to sensitize the body Uh, I'm interested into that topic and uh, how, how could you explain what's in an outer assembly is the really the junior of martial arts? Uh, by taking them through a process of an exercise. Okay, so, so in, in other words, there is a let, me, let, me give an, let me give an example, okay? Yeah. I start, the, when I'm training people, I start with a series of breath control exercises. Breath control, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, when I'm instructing people, these are, these are exercises I didn't learn from my primary calorie teacher, I learned from a Muslim master in Central Sarah. When I'm instructing, uh, he didn't teach me this way, but this is the way I teach them. Focus ahead through a single point. So I'm focused through that point with my external eye. At the same time, I'm looking from 
Namimula through the point. Also, I'm using the inner eye, the mind's eye, to follow the breath. So on an inhalation, if this represents my breath, an exhalation. So, the best thing I can do to answer what I think I understood as, as your question is to give a practical example. I don't know whether that gets at it or not, but I am, there's several inner things that are going on. I'm using, do we have an inner eye? I, you know, according to Colin McGinn, who's a, a, a philosopher, uh, I would follow his analysis of this, and I would argue that there is, you know, something arises when we do certain kinds of processes. This could be called the imagination. Okay? But imagination in English is a really problematic term because we tend to think so visually. It's, it's a dynamic activity. When we're imagining something, we're doing something dynamic. It has an inner dimension, and in this case it has an outer dimension. Because I'm looking ahead, but I'm looking inside myself. So I can't actually look with my physical eye inside myself. But if I do something, there may be a material, palpable, sensory awareness that arises from doing that over time. And so it has inner and outer dimensions. And so uh, it's all one experience when it happens, but it has dimensions, experiential dimensions that we could describe as having, you know, somewhat having inner and outer. It's, it's not necessarily a good way of doing it, but when I'm working with people, I find it useful. And so, again, part of it is a pedagogical tactic on my part. When I'm talking philosophically, I try to disown dualism. I don't feel like it's dualistic. We have this in Kerala culture, Andhavika Mayatu, that's the inner, and you have the outer, and it's marked culturally by certain terms. And so, certain cultures, even if they're primarily monist, sometimes recognize the inner and the outer. And so, uh, sometimes I'm accused of being a dualist, which I find, you know, I, it's just, you know, it, I try to be clear uh, when I'm writing and contextualizing things to make clear uh, that it's it's a it's a tactical thing, um, the inner and the outer, and trying to recognize both. I, I hope that starts to answer. I don't think there is an answer. I do understand it's a very difficult topic to answer definitely. Uh, been involved and are still involved in a kind of relation considering inner and outer and consulting preferences it's extremely difficult because it's uh, also difficult to not just to explain a word before explaining a word you have to uh, communicate this kind of exper experience and this can be quite tricky yes yeah. yes but one th one thing that I do when I'm teaching is I don't try to I don't tell people how to experience yes. that that's important because my experience may be different. Joyce is straight with me, she's from Jordan, she's up there. Anyway, Joyce is, I don't try to tell Joyce, you're going to feel X. Yeah. Because it's like, she's from Jordan. How she assimilates the instructions I give, you know, is for her to figure out. And so this is where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is what it means, or this is what you experience. I'm saying here is a process, a phenomenon, and a process, that we're going to follow. See what arises. Yeah. So for me, this becomes a question. And this is where the notion of dynamic inquiry is embedded. You know, what arises for the individual who's doing that when they receive certain kinds of instructions? I hope that, that yeah, we can talk more later. Yeah. <laughs> Does it, does it relate to the, so the video clip that you showed of the different, the weapons and the, the empty hand Kalari form? Yeah. And you said, look at the weapons, it's a demonstration. You look at the eyes, that they're aiming for the sticks, and it's clearly choreographed. Yeah. Well, so that's an outer demonstration, but there's no lethal force, which would be the inner. Yeah. But there's yeah. no lethal intent. That, yeah, or, that would be, that would, you know, what, if you're emphasizing the outer form and you lose the inner relationship to the form, 
you know, it becomes a bit, it doesn't have the valence, the, the, the power, the shakti of, you know, when you see lethal force, you know, and you're in the room with lethal force, you know it. Yeah. Yeah, when somebody releases a, a sword, when my teacher would do that with me, sparks are flying, you know, off the steel, you know, and it's like, it is, it is frightening, you know, because, you know, you're not, you, you, this is not stage combat. They're not, and, and again, teachers, and this only happens in very, very advanced practice too in Kali Pai, because again, otherwise you've got to go slowly, and, and the teacher has to be able to read whether the student has gotten to a place where they're able to use what I would call absolute lethal force, and the teacher has to be able to pull a blow if the student makes a mistake so that somebody doesn't get hurt. You know, and again, they're, they're, you know, it's that is the way Kalari Pai what is practiced. Uh, you know, uh, you know, sometimes again, there's a lot of practice that that's, that where you don't see that and you don't see it in public demonstrations. Either because of the, yeah, anyway, yeah. You know, could, could you talk a little bit more about your theater company and how you are incorporating? the training, I, I'm particularly curious about whether you are taking a company through through the art to the point where they begin to experience these differences between inner and outer. They begin to build the structure of the body in that, a that's truly the, useful that's, way. That's, that's the purpose of it. You know, and I try to do it very efficiently. And so, I, you know, just before coming here, I was running a four and a half day course for people who haven't done this work before. I mean, is this a company you're working with consistently, or oh, is it people who uh, are just kind no, of coming No, the show? Plan Arts Group, the theater company, yes, because I don't, we're not a, we don't have state subsidy, so I can't have a, I'd love to have, but if, if there's a patron around, <laughs> anyone wants to support the theater company, uh, welcome patronage. But uh, the funding realities are such that, no, it's not a permanent group of people, but when I work, uh, you know, I try to work I use this, this work with actors. So last year I was directing in Norway. This is completely separate from my own company, but I was invited to go because the artistic director wanted her actors in Norway to experience this training. So the company of 10 went through the training with me over a six week period, and we applied it. These, and it's a non verbal piece written by a Japanese playwright and author. And so I have a book or two you can read. Um, I think they're probably in the biography. Yeah, um, yeah. About how I use, that's what I mean. It's like, right. it would take me way too long to explain it, but I immediately try to, to uh, get people, uh, draw people's attention to, again, the nuances that are inside, the potential that's inside these forms. Uh, and so, uh, again, that, that's a tactic on my part to, um, to help sensitize them and open them up in a certain way. Do you feel like they, they get it in Joyce? Do yes. you get it? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and by that I mean, you know, when you go study for seven years, you get it in a certain way. Yes. Incorporate it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And and you, you don't, you know you can't give that in six weeks, but no. what can you give? Is it, well, that's, is it that's always the question. And so it's like, it depends on, on meeting someone. You know, uh, I always explain when I, I'm very fortunate because I've never had to teach people who didn't want to learn what I had to teach. You know, it's like that's impossible with this kind of stuff. But if somebody doesn't want to learn, you know, like this unusual approach is if an actor came and just, you know, and thought this was barking mad, you know, that, that's going to do no good whatsoever um, for whatever reason. Um, People who encounter this work, uh, if they find it useful, they all sometimes they want to do more. Uh, and if they don't, that's fine because they may have learned something. Because they actors are often often have multiple trainings, or I work with a lot of dancers, and so they already have a really strong sense of embodiment through their other practices. And that's the other thing. There's a meeting inside each individual of these multiple practices. And that's why I use Tai Chi and Kalari Pai and yoga, because uh, I, I don't want to reduce things to one specific 
form or style. And the Tai Chi does a certain kind of work that Kalavi Paya doesn't do, and vice versa. And the yoga does something, and so they're all complementary from my perspective. And those help feed different dimensions of a kind of uh, corporeal, inner outer sensory awareness that might be possible. And it always has to do with your relationship both inside and to the space you're inhabiting. Because again, the martial arts are wonderful that way in relation to 360 degree awareness. So, um, yeah, uh, I hope that starts, but again, uh, uh, lots of stuff I've written in again. Yeah, thank you very much for the mind blowing <laughs> experience. Um, my question is a bit of a strange one. It's why, but let me give you a context for it. Um, in the martial arts, I've seen many people who perform martial arts. I can think of one lovely lady who won, I think, gold in one of the top English Tai Chi competitions. And she was a dancer. And when you watched her Tai Chi, it was externally perfect, but there was no intent. Um, the why is, why do you want actors with that internal intent? What does it, what does it bring to what they do as an actor, is what interests me. Yeah. An animating depth that is very hard to articulate and explain, but there's something more. And again, when you're doing martial arts, if you do something full on, there's something more. What is it? And again, you know, it, and however we try to explain it, sometimes we can point to it and we can see it and it's palpable, but you can't necessarily, in our discursive languages and critical vocabularies, this is why I try to use phenomenology to help. I think it does help because it points to certain dimensions of experience and allows us to unpack those experiences in certain ways without it becoming overly subjective or about me or my ego but about, a certain, about attempting to, to, again, get at some kind of, of um, possibility of, as much as we can, capturing something about those extraordinary experiences. Are there any particular kinds of actors that, that work with you, <laughs> what you work with? Well, the, the, so for example, um, in my mind, I'm trying to see where they benefit. Because obviously, a lot of people who perform, perform well, but without that inner aspect. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and again, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I don't know that I can really answer that, but, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I can really answer it because it's a very diverse group of people. Some are, are more dancers, some are more actors, and um, they can take, and again, how, how and what they make of it. Each individual, I leave that to those individuals to articulate. And, um, but I, I, I'm very fortunate because I, I, I share this work all over the world and, so, and I have people teaching like many, many different places this, this kind of work. And so, um, and I, I've had just remarkable people who've worked with me, you know, uh, uh, for a very long time. You know, 12, 14, 15 years uh, training and, and you know, so it's the way things usually work with these practices. Yeah? Your approach is very syncretic. I mean, uh, it combines. Pardon, could you speak up just a little? Uh, your, your approach is very syncretic, again, combining as it does drama, philosophy, martial arts, and other areas. What do you think the advantages of this are, and perhaps the disadvantages, if any? Well, Again, I, I tried to, in this talk, in this talk, to be rather uh, broad and to, to paint uh, some larger kinds of issues uh, and pictures. Uh, and so, um, in, um, in, in my book, When the Body Becomes All Lies, because so little had been written about the martial arts, I mean, I wrote the book, I think I finished it in 1996 or so, something like that, because it was published in 98. And so that's a long time ago. And so in terms of things that have been written about martial arts ethnographically, and it is an ethnography, uh, you know, there was very little, if anything, that I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I had to invent what to do. 
And coming out of theater studies and performance studies, th th there isn't a methodology in either one. It's an area of practice. And so how, how, do, you, how do you try and engage in research that's appropriate and what do you do? And, and so this is why I, 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 I try to, to paint a larger picture, and that's what I wanted to do today, to go, here's a large picture. But within that, when you start looking at very specific dimensions, like if you start looking at the direction of attention, the work of imagination, you start looking at very specific, you know, embodied dimensions of practice. Uh, when I'm giving massage, for example, you know, again, I'm not looking at what I'm doing. It's totally tactile and totally related to my energy. Now, at a certain point, you can begin to describe that. And that's unfolding a certain kind of, of embodied practice and a certain kind of knowledge that's in that practice and that arises in and through that practice and through certain kinds of training. And so the specific is just as important as the, you know, it, uh, and again, so sometimes I'm writing things that are much more specific. An article that's focused on attention and awareness with one or two exercises. Because again, to do that in detail is incredibly, you know, it's like, how do you get at, you know, the complexities of what that is uh, and what that, that is like? And I think that's what, again, Martin, it's great that martial arts studies is having this kind of uh, development in relation to methodologically and so on, you know, it's such a a fantastically rich area. But part of my purpose today was to call attention to these parallel, you know, along with them, you know, because many martial arts have medical practices that go with them. And you have to understand, and that, that was another thing for me, I had to understand Ayurveda and yoga to begin to understand Kavali Paya, because those are the cultural paradigms that shape how Malayalis and people in India understand experience. I knew nothing about those. I mean, it, it took years of research to kind of, you know, to start to be able to understand it. Uh, so the complexities of these, of all embodied practices, uh, you know, and, and trying to get a perspective that will open up a certain dimension of that. So I don't expect to be able to do that for everything, like with media. It's like, I'm going to look at Dr. Paul and others, really. But I can point to its importance and go, this is really important. And what's the relationship between the mediatization uh, and the representational practices uh, that help to, to frame these uh, practices today and actual practice? There's also, um, in one of the Jackie Chan movies, which I'm sure Paul knows, that myth.